So heartfelt welcome, everybody. Uh, this is the book launch and expert roundtable on the newly published book, Comparing Post-Socialist Media Systems, The Case of Southeastern Europe, that just came out at Routledge in 2021. And we have the three distinguished authors of the book with us, Zrinka Perushko, Dina Vojab, and Anatolia Chuvalo, all three at the University of Zagreb. And we also have a distinguished uh, European panel uh, uh, consisting of Catherine Botmer of the University of Leeds, Paolo Mancini of the University of Perugia, Eplauk, University of Juvescule in Finland, and Mikhail Suslov and myself uh, representing the University of Copenhagen in the panel. And when I say it's a European panel, it's not only the composition of the universities and the participants, but interestingly enough, many of the partic participants are employed at universities outside of their home countries. Mm. I didn't even mention name of the countries here, just the cities, because we all belong to the same uh, European media and communication research and education space. I'm extremely happy to welcome you all and also to welcome our viewers, both on Zoom and YouTube. We have a live stream and the event is also recorded for uh, future viewers. This book is a landmark indeed. It's a pioneering study of media systems in Southeastern Europe in a historical perspective. It provides and puts forward a path-breaking methodology of fuzzy set variables it's also comparative, looking at different areas to the independent countries in Southeastern Europe. It's path bracing, it's in historical breadth and the long duration, long durée historical perspective. It's also path breaking in terms of formulating uh, and uh, historical variables that overlap with media system thinking, media systems uh, theorizing and conceptualization. And it breaks down barriers between media and communication studies, journalism studies, history, political science, sociology, and a particular approach called historical institutionalism that's prevalent in mainstream sociology and political science. So it's a truly outstanding uh, book. And many of us, uh, we are happy to uh, volunteer to involve in this uh, um, roundtable to launch it. So we would like to contribute to the successful start. So Houston is ready to launch uh, the book. And I would like to ask uh, uh, the participants of our panel uh, to say a few words about why they think uh, this is an important book, what's their take, what's their aspects that they would like to highlight what is it they would like to emphasize? Why this is such an important book? So perhaps Catherine, would you like to start? And each uh, participant will have about seven minutes to explain. Okay. So, yeah. Um, thank you, Miklos, for, for organizing this panel. It's really a great event, um, even though we can't really meet in person, but uh, that's better than nothing. Um, yeah, and I would just join what Niklas already said and um, congratulate the, the authors, Renika, Tina, and Antonia for this excellent pu uh, publication. I think, um, yeah, the book provides a truly unique insight into, I think, a region of Europe, which is often regarded as at the fringes or at the periphery of Europe. But in fact, I think it has been and still is at the very center of European history and politics. So it is very important that we have this kind of book, uh, which goes into in depth uh, like this book. So equally important, as Niklas already mentioned, I think, is the conceptual and empirical advancements of this, of this study, which I really find exemplary and I hope that similar studies will follow on other regions following a similar design. So the, uh, in their book, the, the authors ask the question, why are media systems as they are? What are the conditions and influences that have shaped the media systems in the region that would explain the similarities and differences between the countries they are looking at? 
unlike most other studies, they go back into history over the last 200 years to trace the forces of uh, modernity, socialism and democratization. And this historical approach allows the authors to explain change other than just to describe existing structures. So um, the question could also be asked the other way around, I think, how do media systems and changes in media systems affect political systems and political change? And maybe I use this book a little bit as a jumping board to, to expand some ideas along this question. So, um, how does media systems and media change affect political change? Is this a media meaningful question at all? After all, the political system is usually, and I think rightfully, be regarded as the more powerful one, and therefore the primary independent variable. However, as Blamle and Gorovic point out, both systems are highly interdependent, and changes in one system would lead to changes in the other. So to, uh, to reflect on this interdependency, I would like to use the concept of hybridity, which I have been thinking about recently a bit, but which is also employed in the book by Perusco, uh, Perusco et al. It might be a bit of a buzzword uh, at the moment, but I think it is a useful tool to understand current changes in the politics media nexus, um, because both political scientists and media uh, scholars have employed the concepts in their field. So um, to use this reverse question, the question would then be, how do political hybridity and media hybridity interact? And what is the impact of media hy hy uh, hybridization on the politics of hybrid disease? So maybe just briefly, um, and I think um, this is also explained already in the book, um, hybrid political regimes incorporate both democratic and authoritarian institutions and practices. And some of the countries analyzed in the book are actually categorized as such, for example, Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. So this juxtaposition um, between incongruent elements, democratic and authorita uh, authoritarian elements, leads to a constant tension that pushes or pulls the system into the uh, opposite direction. An interesting um, extension of this discussion, I think, is provided by Andreas Schädler, who argues that this ambiguity generates a permanent state of uncertainty, in particular informational uncertainty or epistemic uncertainty. For example, if you manipulate elections, there always remains a certain element of uncertainty about the outcome. And a similar argument could be made about media freedom. So even though media freedom is restricted in all hybrid regimes, it does exist to a certain degree and generates an ambiguous public sphere where mouthpiece journalism exists alongside outrageous attack journalism. So um, I want to illustrate this point with two elements, probably only one um, uh, regarding the time. Uh, to, 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 to illustrate the argument. And one um, is about political parallelism and the other one about technological change. So to start with political parallelism, which also plays an important role in, in Perusco's book, um, most if not all media system and hybrid regimes are characterized by various kinds of parallelism, partisan, religious, ethnic, and so on reflecting different inter-elite power arrangements that help actually to manage uncertainty in the context of competitive authoritarianism. But political parallelism, parallelism is in itself a hybrid media constellation that combines two ostensibly contradicting principles, pluralism and control. So the media in each segment of the system are loyal to their own sponsors, meaning control, and equally hostile to, comp uh, to competing seg segments in the uh, to com competing segments or groups, which generates pluralism. So while journalists of each segment promote the agenda of their own group, they are eager to uncover wrongdoings in other segments and their leaders, which uh, leads to a bonanza of watchdog journalism, which in many cases is not always strictly committed to facts. So 
put it mildly. So under the conditions of competitive parallelism, the ambiguity or hybrid hybridity between media freedom and its restrictions generates legitimacy. We can attack power holders, but at the same time also a high degree of informational uncertainty because nobody knows and can be sure what dark dealings will be revealed next. Um, so, um, bum, bum. I think I haven't really followed my time, uh, but I think uh, I only touched very briefly on technological change, which is also um, is maybe uh, particularly pertinent at the moment with the rise of digital media and it sort of generates what Chadwick calls a new hybrid media system in which is very difficult analytically to integrate in what Hallen and Mancini uh, uh, suggested in their yeah, equally outstanding book on comparing media systems. So both the, uh, the, the, did the proliferation of channels is uh, parallel with the prolifer proliferation of new roles where a large number of influential opinion leaders online are doing what normally journalists do, setting the agenda, shaping narratives, investigate and holding power to account, but they do so outside any organizational framework, which we would normally describe as media system. So undoubtedly, this digital communication technologies have dramatically increased informational uncertainty in hybrid regimes. And the question is, how do hybrid regimes respond to this challenge? Obviously, they have changed the risk benefit ratio of hybridity. Many hybrid regimes seem to have come to the conclusion that the risk of tolerating a certain degree of free speech outweighs the benefits. And we can observe a general push towards authoritarianism um, uh, around the world. So, okay, coming back to my initial question of turning around the log uh, logic of causality between media and political system, media change and political change, I was wondering whether the authors have found any indication in their empirical material that would point into that direction. It might be completely speculative, but I thought it would be a, quite an interesting extension of the discussion. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. This is a fascinating expose and the authors will have a chance to respond. And you mentioned uh, Helen and Mancini's path-breaking monograph, and we are happy enough to have Paolo Mancini from the University of Perugia with us. So Paolo, would you like to go ahead with your remarks, please? Yes, thanks. Thanks, Nikos, for organizing this. Thanks to Zrinka and to the other co-author. Uh, I, I accepted to write the foreword to this book. It means that uh, I like the book, so very clearly. So I don't have to add anything good about the book. And instead, uh, I will point out something that could be developed further in the book. Uh, let me say also something that maybe not many know, that when uh, Initially, uh, Zrik asked me if I could write a, a foreword to the book. It was, uh, I don't know how many years ago. Uh, uh, so the, the, the writing of the book uh, took a long time. Mm. Uh, and no uh, once a month, more or less, uh, Zrik wrote to me, I'm finishing, I'm finishing, and uh, a month passed. Then the month after, I'm finishing, I'm finishing. I, at the end, I thought that the book could never appear, and instead, it is, <laughs> it is here. So, uh, I have just questions for the three authors, uh, uh, simple questions, uh, and uh, not, not sort of disagreement, but uh, points that I would like the authors could stress better. Uh, I think that in the book, there are two very interesting and uh, original in some way, uh, points that need to be uh, developed further. Uh, in a way, I think that in the book, there is too much. And uh, at the end, these two issues that uh, I would like the authors to develop further, uh, get lost in the amount of uh, knowledge, uh, data, 
uh, hypothesis that the book contains, which are the two points that I like a lot and that, that in my view could, could need uh, a further development. One is the issue of uh, periodization. I think this is a very interesting issue. And uh, I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure. I don't remember how many other uh, works have, uh, have stressed this point of different periods in, in the history of media and politics. This is very interesting. Uh, but the, the authors uh, to this issue of periodization, uh, I, I noticed this morning, give to this issue just a few pages. And instead, this, this is an idea that uh, they serve. Zrinka, this is something that you have uh, to work more for in the next months. So don't ask me another time to, 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 write, a, to, to write a forward, if not within a short period of time. Uh, periodization is very interesting, but I wonder, uh, you devote just a few pages to the periodization. And uh, the question is, uh, as you are dealing with different countries, the, the periodization that you, that you suggest in the book uh, can work for all the countries that you investigate. Uh, this is a big issue. And uh, uh, I, I would like to have a book just developing uh, the issue of periodization in uh, Central Eastern European countries, in Southern Eastern European countries. This is very, could be very interesting book. Mostly because, and here comes the second point I want to stress, because a very interesting point of the book is the point of uh, uh, Soviet heritage, the Soviet legacy. Uh, uh, my question to, to Zrinka, uh, Dina and Antonia would be, if you have to, to give your students, uh, master students or BA students, a short idea of what is the Soviet legacy, uh, what you would suggest in few words? Uh, th this could be another very interesting, if, first of all, there is a legacy of a Soviet, uh, of a Soviet experience, because this is, is an interrogation, is also an interrogation mark. If there is a legacy of a, of a Soviet experience, which is this? Uh, please give us, and I finish here very briefly, give us a, a very short uh, summary of what is a, a main a main legacy of the Soviet experience. This is an issue that uh, uh, I discuss a lot with uh, Ep Lauk, and I know that she does not agree with me on this, but I think instead that the, 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 le the legacy of the past, and in particular case, the legacy of, ex of the Soviet experience could be very interesting for all the countries that uh, have passed through the, 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 communist, uh, the, the communist regime how the legacy of the past is still, if is still affecting today the, media, the relationship between media and politics, uh, in which way? This is, could be another interesting idea for a, a, a new book. Uh, if you promise to write a book in a few months, you can ask me for a new foreword. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Paolo. So now, as I understand, there are two new, Thank you, Paula. new book projects you're <laughs> suggesting. One is about periodization and the other is about the Soviet legacy and the yes. Soviet level in the long run. Thank you so much. And you already mentioned Ep Lauk, who is our next uh, panelist uh, to appreciate uh, the book. So please, Ep, the Zoom floor is yours. Thank you, Miklos. Well, um, you said why I appreciate the book. My first uh, uh, idea was that I learned so much about former Yugoslavia and uh, <laughs> how much differed from the socialism, Yugoslavian socialism differed from the other socialism that was within the Soviet Union. But first of all, I congratulate the authors of the book for their ex excellent achievement. And I won't hesitate to say that this book is a solid milestone in the body of research in the development of mass media in East Central Europe. 
when we look at the studies of post-socialist media, we can find a number of good country descriptions, comparisons between different countries, comparisons of the development of certain news media, most often public service broadcasting, or certain specific aspects related to these media, such as markets, media policies, and so on. All of these studies answer the question how, what, when happened in these countries' media systems since 1988-1989, uh, as is pointed out also in, in our book we are talking about. Uh, yet we do not find any study which should strive to comprehensively answer the most difficult question, why? Why, in spite of seemingly similar departure points, did countries follow divergent paths after 1989? Provoked by the author's promise to answer to this why, I read the book through in one go, and I enjoyed it really. Why so? I have been doing research in the post-communist journalism and media for over 30 years since the big transformation process started. Together with colleagues from Latvia and Lithuania, we did a comparative study on the Baltic media development from the 17th century until 1993, the year when the book... This was the first book ever, I don't know if you see, about the Baltic media in, in English. We had no idea of critical junctures or path dependency approach or any system analysis of the media. These simply had to be yet in invented. Nevertheless, when I was reading Srinkas and her team's book, many parallels between our two books came to mind. We had intuitively followed the same logic that the current book builds on. A diachronic view of changes in the media as the consequence of the historical events and turning points that changed the trajectory of the development of politics, institutions, cultures, collective actors, values, etc., etc., in three countries in the same region. In 1993, we did not know how it would all unfold within the next 30 years where we are now. Now we know. And we can look back from an even longer distance. <clears throat> In a way, the current book stands at the end of one era of researching East Central European post-socialist media transformations. On the other hand, it throws open new perspectives in media research, theoretically, methodologically, and empirically, offering a novel framework for studying media transformations. This book is also an example of how media studies borrow from other disciplines. In this case, mainly from political science and sociology. One important particularity of this book that renders it distinct from previous studies is that it clearly takes a non-media centric position and focuses on change how to problematize the change in media systems, how to periodize and how to compare these changes. This is not an easy task at all, as the changes are parts of processes, they are not static. The authors solve the issue by applying theories which proved useful in political science, the historical institutionalism and the path dependency theory that analyzes the changing capacity of institutions by taking into account their historic structures. The analysis of critical junctures is a part of path dependence arguments and helps to construct the basis for periodizations. Critical juncture analysis is popular in comparative historical research. It provides tools for studying the political origins and change of important institutional arrangements that have a long-lasting influence on their social and political environment. The authors 
have determined four critical junctures in the media systems change, modernization, socialism, post-socialist democratization, and communication juncture, which they then analyze in detail. And uh, partly I would now refer to, to Paolo's question about um, periodization, that uh, saying that this kind of periodization actually fits to all these uh, six countries that we are talking about. It has been pointed out by some scholars previously that in media systems research, the rural culture has remained marginal or missing. Mm -hmm. This book devotes significant attention to the cultural factors, as well as the formation and development of media culture and journalistic professionalism, what has been my focus of, uh, of uh, uh, research and interest as well. The cultural dimension is an organic part of the analysis framework in this book, along with politics and economy, which is a strength of this book. Another particularity of this book is its qualitative approach. And even more, the authors succeeded in demonstrating that the fuzzy set approach which they apply works, although this is still considered to be in the process of being developed. To summarize, this book is rich in novel ideas and viewpoints that will certainly inspire other scholars, especially the younger generations in their future research in the media transformations. Thank you. Thank, <clears throat> thank you so much, Ep. Uh, uh, this was a truly great appreciation and the only uh, thing why I feel sorry for this because I wanted to speak mostly about the same things. <laughs> so I really appreciated uh, your thoughts. Our next uh, panelist is my colleague at the University of Copenhagen, Mikhail Suslov, who is a historian of particularly Russian history, specializing in digital Eastern Europe. And uh, Mikhail, uh, please uh, go ahead with your remarks. Thank you, Miklos, uh, and hi, everyone. Um, as Miklos has already said, I need to make a uh, short caveat. I'm not uh, studying this inside the topic of media studies. I'm rather uh, slightly on the periphery uh, with the specific focus on area studies, specifically Russia and uh, uh, humanities rather than social sciences. So I'm not exactly making the commentary on the book, but rather trying to think together with the book and probably use it as a kind of springboard for my own understanding of uh, media system in Russia. And um, um, my, my talk will be kind of uh, bullet point structured lessons for, for the scholar of Russian media. Uh, mm -hmm. So to start with, uh, uh, the most important point is probably the longitudinal and multidisciplinary approach to uh, the connections between media and politics, media and the state. Uh, yeah, and I, as I'm talking, I will be kind of uh, flashing it out by giving some examples, giving some blood and flesh to my points. So uh, if you take Russian uh, political development from the bird's eye viewpoint, you, uh, of course, uh, uh, agree with me that Russia has always been a hypertrophic, hypertrophically developed state uh, with anti and uh, well, yeah, anti-democratic or illiberal traditions. Uh, even the first Russian newspaper was established by order of Peter the Great. So the Russian media emerged as pa part of the state apparatus, more specifically as part of the state security apparatus, not as part of the public sphere. Um, what is happening today in Russia, and according to many analysts, uh, today's Russia in front of our eyes is transforming from uh, competitive to hegemonic authoritarianism, uh, and it, it is a very powerful um, driver for the media change as well, because uh, under competitive authoritarianism, you still have some niche for independent oppositional media, 
uh, and you have some businesses which find it profitable to pay to this niche and extract some profit. And what we, what we seek right now uh, is that uh, this niche is shrinking and uh, uh, because of the state restrictions and because it, it simply is not profitable any longer to invest in, in the uh, independent media because uh, the market is so uh, microscopic. Uh, so yeah, in in place in in step with the political change, you have some media changes as well. The, the second aspect of uh, the same first point is the geopolitical um, approach. I would put it like that. Um, in contrast to other countries uh, in uh, in the Balkans, for example, in Central Europe, Russia has always been a contiguous large continental scale Eurasian empire on the crossroad of uh, many cultures and uh, civilizations with a very specific sensibility to security. So the media has always been perceived as not just a security thing, but also as part of the strategic defense apparatus. Uh, harking back to history, um, uh, take for example Russian Emperor Paul I, uh, this is the last decade of uh, 18th century, he banned any import of foreign books on the account that they contain pernicious ideas which can kind of destroy Russian cultural code or whatever. Uh, and uh, th this ban on foreign books with uh, different variations and different uh, exemptions, uh, it kind of survived 100 years and was lived it only in 1905. And if you look at today's Russian speeches about media, it simply um, drives the same hobby horse of uh, interpreting media as the strategic defense apparatus. Uh, I, I, it kind of gave me a pause when I um, read some um, important Russian political figures who say that uh, pro-Western newspaper in Russia is like the aircraft carrier on the Russian borders. So it's, it's, uh, even on the rhetorical level, we see this parallel between the media and the existential geopolitical threat from the West to Russia. Um, another aspect is the economic uh, uh, long durée um, perspective for understanding uh, the Russian media structure. Unlike the West, where the booming industry, and it has been covered by uh, the book in question quite in uh, many, de many de details, uh, while in the West, uh, the booming industry uh, created the demand for media which supplied business with uh, more or less credible information. In Russia, the first important industrialization ha happened in uh, under the Soviets in the 30s. And that is why the this function of the media was simply unthinkable. It was not needed because the information was not marketable good uh, when, when the market was created, like uh, the nationwide um, industry-based market. Um, even today, if you look at what is happening in today's Russian media and economics, uh, on the superficial level, you will probably be arguing that, okay, Russia is just like, say, Italy or no, Czech Republic, because you still have lots of uh, private businesses which owe uh, different publishing outlets. Okay, but let's uh, dig deeper into that. And when you do that, you will see uh, this constant imbrication between political power and economic power. So uh, I'm giving my uh, favorite example to my students. Two major Russian TV channels out of the 10 are owned by certain Alina Kabaeva. And this girl is Putin's mistress. <laughs> so this it kind of explains the whole um, media and economic environment in a very different light. So you cannot put Russia on the same board with, uh, for example, Czech Republic, uh, simply because you have this very specific uh, uh, connection between business and, and the political power. Uh, another aspect is ideational. Yeah, and I still have kind of couple, couple of minutes, I guess it will be just enough for me to finish to wrap this up. Uh, so the ideational or ideological aspect, I think that this could have been theorized and contextualized um, even, even better and probably the uh, next volume could be um, devoted directly to that because uh, sometimes we, 
uh, we kind of accept this on the intuitive level that uh, free media and liberalism, they go hand in hand. But why? Uh, it's not because uh, uh, free media are kind of byproduct or side trap of liberalism. It's in the very heart of the liberal political philosophy. If you are a um, um, free, adult, reasonable person, then you have, then you must not have any external authority for who can tell you what to watch and what to read. This is the very uh, center of uh, liberalism. Uh, the same question pertains to the connection between uh, media and communism and the ideology. And as uh, the book in question illustrates, you have examples when uh, socialism and, and, um, um, and media could live in quite good symbiosis. Think about Yugoslavia or think about Soviet Union um, in the last five years under Perestroika and Glasnost. So uh, there is no kind of principle of philosophical um, contradiction between free media and socialism. So what is the problem? The problem is probably populism. Yeah, this, the, this ideology, the regime, the um, regime ideology of populism slash conservative communitarianism is uh, not conducive for free media. Uh, yeah, for a very simple reason, because uh, populism is about stable core of national identity. And then you have uh, media outlets who support this core and media outlets who kind of uh, attack on that. So you differentiate between that. Uh, and my point is precisely that contemporary Russian uh, regime ideology is uh, uh, head and shoulders inside this um, right wing uh, communitarianism slash mm -hmm. Uh, populism, and that is why it's not it's not very well commensurable with free media. And the very last point, um, yeah, uh, this is the just one example of the cultural long durée um, connection between uh, culture and uh, and the media. This is the Russian Orthodox Church and uh, the media. Uh, for many decades, for many centuries, the Russian Orthodox Church was kind of neutral to the media regime until approximately beginning of 2000s. Why? Because the new digital media are very much against the, the theology of orthodoxy. The orthodox theology claims that the God created the world and the virtual reality, digital reality, they double the world. So they do the devil's work. So suddenly on, the, on, the, on these deep seated grounds of cultural uh, religious um, um, fundaments, uh, the church turned into one of the most significant hater of uh, the last remaining free uh, outlets in Russia, the, the digital media. Okay, so uh, here I stop and just sum this up by saying that I think it's important not to absolutize the importance of the Soviet um, experience for understanding the media. I think that the uh, durée should be even longer. Uh, and yeah, and the, the longitudinal approach will be combined with the multidisciplinary approach tapping into cultural and ideational aspects. Yeah, so here I stop. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed, Mikhail. <clears throat> when we study Southeastern Europe and Eastern Central Europe, I often felt that uh, the Western European approaches, comparative approaches, give only one potential approach to a Janus-faced reality. And we always missed a Russian Central East European or Russian Southeast European mm -hmm. perspective. And your position is just perfect to enlighten those uh, perspectives. <clears throat> so it's my turn to express my appreciation uh, for this book. Uh, many of us used works, words such as landmark, milestone, pioneering. And I agree, I'm sorry, <clears throat> and I agree with, with those terms and I would use uh, myself uh, those terms. I was, as I was preparing for this little uh, contribution, I was thinking what I could share in a couple of minutes and I thought I should highlight only three things that's easy to remember. So the first thing I'd like to highlight is that it's not a media centered book in a sense that it doesn't look at media per se, but takes a perspective and looks at media from other historical, social, political, economic contexts. As uh, the late Karol Jakubowicz, the doyen of Eastern Central European media studies said, the best media studies work is not media centered. 
And Zrinka and mm -hmm. Kuhn also uh, quote other authors who suggest the same thing. And I fully appreciate uh, this position. The closer we go to media systems, to media institutions, media practices, uh, the more we can enlarge the details. But the more perspective, the more bird's eye perspective, the more analytical distance we can take, the more space there is, the contours of the big picture may be seen better. And in my view, this is an exemplary uh, work uh, in that. The longer and more spacious the approach, the richer the analysis could be. And the closer we go to the minuscule detail, the danger is the more descriptive our uh, endeavor becomes. This book is also extremely clean, clear and the structure is clean in terms of input variables, defining uh, input variables and output variables, impact variables. And at the same time, looking at the variables of media systems in a historical perspective themselves. So that's the word, the first point, why I think this is a truly outstanding book, the contextualization, the non-media centered characteristics of the analysis. The second one is the long way approach that several of my colleagues already um, mentioned. And I would like to expose this a little bit in um, a sharper language. Many political scientists, media analysts, sociologists analyze contemporary authoritarianism in Central and Eastern Europe and other parts of the world in a, in a light which is just synchronous, just in a synchronous uh, perspective. As if Viktor Orban came out of nowhere, as if hung Hungarian history since the Middle Ages hadn't um, existed, as if uh, the devil just appeared out of nowhere. The same uh, for Erdogan in Turkey, just open the newspapers or, or the BBC or, or any Western media. Where does this bad guy come from? Without looking at the history of, of Turkish um, authoritarianism from Kemal Ataturk and back in, in the Ottoman Empire. The same for Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. He's depicted as the bad guy who is threatening the West with um, digital warfare and other aims. But if we look at 70 years of communism in history and Tsarism before, Putin can be easily seen in a historical perspective as the new Tsar or Erdogan as the new Sultan. So the long durée approach truly gives breath to our understanding. The same uh, approach could be relevant for China, understanding Xi Jinping. Uh, he's uh, depicted with uh, much truth as uh, the, the leader who tries to put China in the role of the globe, new hegemonic uh, rule. But look at the history of Chinese, the Chinese emperor system that definitely looked at China as the only empire under the sky. And compared to China, all other empires and countries are peripheral. It's the same continuity, long to a continuity, Xi Jinping as the new emperor. So to me, this kind of uh, long to uh, thinking is very important to understand present day conflicts, geopolitics, uh, geostrategic tensions and conflicts. And I'm not uh, definitely a Samuel Hunt Huntingtonian clash of civilization person, because I think it's empires and not civilizations that clash. Civilizations are based on world religions, uh, Confucianism, uh, uh, Eastern Orthodox Church or Western Catholicism and the papal uh, state. But it's empires that often act in the name of long uh, durée civilizations. So the long durée approach helps to understand this competition of civilizations that becomes so important in 21st century politics. And um, this book, which uh, has the title of Comparing Post-Socialist Media Systems, actually starts with the Ottoman and Habsburg empires. And perhaps in the 21st century, we are back to the era of digital empires or digital civilizations uh, and their uh, competition. So it's very important to take the long term uh, historical approach. and. I uh, just became familiar with this book uh, 
a, a year ago uh, when I invited Zrinka to a, a workshop in Copenhagen. And then we both had the aha experience because we engaged in a long period censorship, a comparative censorship uh, project. And I thought uh, that the approaches were uh, related uh, in a way. And the whole idea of Ferdinand Brodel and the Anna School and their actuality, they, it's, it's a new phenomenon. Now, most of us in this panel speak that language, which was not the case uh, just a few years ago. So it seems that there's a, a revival of the Anna School long durée uh, mm, pro, uh, perspective, and that's uh, mostly due to, to this book. So I would really like to express uh, the importance uh, and appreciation for that aspect. And the third thing I'd like to highlight is the historical institutionalism approach, which was already discussed here, that looks at regime trajectories, path development, and then sudden historical junctures, ruptures, revolutions, regime changes, openness, opening up, and then reclosing again. And I'm so happy to see this in media and communication a scholarship because it creates bridges or blends our discipline with mainstream sociology and mainstream political science, which was very rarely the case. Uh, very often media communications journalism research was not informed by mainstream political science or sociology or history uh, for that matter, but somehow periodic, uh, periodic uh, sporadically and periodically sometimes we picked up notions, but here we have the mainstreaming of communication scholarship, media scholarship to political science and sociology and the other way around, mainstreaming sociology and political science in uh, communication and uh, media scholarship. So this book could be easily taught in uh, sociology or political science departments or reviewed in those journals, which is not the case. And as actually we did some marketing for the present roundtable, Zrinka and I shared the invitation in, in several ECREA and ICA and, and other websites. And in some of the comments, I saw some editors of journals of not media and, and communication science journals, but other political science, political economy journals asking each other, the editors asking, hmm, should we review this? So I will come and back, yes, you should. And, and, and this just indicates how important this blending uh, or putting back our discipline to mainstream social science is. So that's the third uh, point. And I would like to ask a couple of uh, smaller questions. How do you see the role of historical personalities at the moment of openings, historical junctures? We, <clears throat> this week we have an um, inter-university uh, city center Dubrovnik seminar and we asked uh, this question there as well. So what happened if it's not Josip Broz Tito who took over after the war, but mm -hmm. another leader? Uh, what in Hungary if it's 1956 after the revolution, if it's not Janos Kadar, who mm -hmm. is the more reformist regime mm -hmm. after some time, but a, Stal a more Stalinist, more pro brezhnev uh, mm -hmm. communist leader who takes over. Yeah. The historical trajectory, the path development could have been different in those countries. And I, I wonder what the three authors uh, uh, think about uh, this. And more conceptually, theoretically, it's fascinating to see how um, structures, what is possible, as Brodel says, structure is that defines of what is possible, contradicts um, or creates a tension with the willingness of, of the leaders who act pretty freely, seemingly pretty freely in those ruptures, because the sphere is open in those ruptures. There are no constraints, but the constraints come in later on to limit what is possible. So I wonder how this, how, what do you think about this? How relevant is this for your project in this book and how you dealt with this in the book? I also have two smaller questions. Why to start with the bourgeois revolutions in the 19th century? Why not even earlier, the introduction of printing? There is the famous also anal book on the birth of printing, the, become, the coming of the book that looks at the role of, of uh, 
printing, the spread of print cultures from Germany and Western Europe uh, to Eastern Europe and the role of book culture in humanism, Renaissance, and then later Protestantism and the Enlightenment. Uh, and also Elizabeth Eisenstein uh, spoke uh, about the role of the print, printing press as the process of change. It seems that that kind of work um, is uh, very, or Robert Darnton's uh, work on uh, print cultures is very relevant uh, to the project. So that would make the role of um, printing press, media communications, even more comprehensive from the beginning of mass communication, which is printing. That's how uh, it all began. And finally, a very minuscule question. This is a very historically engaged book. Why is there no history in the title? When one looks at the mm -hmm. comparing post-socialist media systems, the case of Southeastern Europe, it looks like a, a contemporary book. Mm -hmm. I really miss the, the media history and wide, wider scope of, of history uh, from the title. And uh, finally, I am really hopeful that this book uh, is just the beginning of other uh, similar books in, for other countries in the region and also for Western European countries and for Russia. And perhaps one of the initiatives that we started at our workshop in Copenhagen with Zrinka and Mikhail on long durée censorship history, comparative censorship history, mm -hmm. Central Europe, Southeastern Europe, and Russia could be an offshoot of this excellent book. So I would like to stop here. And um, at this point, we had uh, five um, intermissions or five contributions from different uh, scholars and disciplines. And I would like to ask Zrinka first uh, to uh, make uh, your comments uh, to the followed up with Dina and Antonia. So please, Zrinka. Thank you so much, uh, Miklos, for organizing this and uh, everyone for for these uh, so so kind words. And it's really lucky I'm wearing pink so it doesn't show I'm blushing. <laughs> and uh, um, for us, it was, yeah, for us it was, you know, uh, really, um, and, and we talked about this a little bit with the students in the IUC course yesterday. For Eastern European scholars uh, who are based in Eastern Europe, who sit in the universities uh, in Eastern Europe, um, it's not so easy to, to get published in a major, uh, major publishing house. And uh, for this, I, I really want to first thank Paola because uh, your support, uh, <laughs> this discussion, and uh, uh, always in the Dubrovnik course, but also in uh, uh, discussing at different conferences and, and emails, this was really something that ensured to me that uh, if we were able to finish the book, and the book is good, that this will um, somehow give us a seal of approval of Western scholarship. And also mm -hmm. then after that, Thanks so much uh, to Katrin um, and also to, to uh, people who are not uh, here, um, John Downey and Slavko Splihal, who also agreed to, to uh, write the blurb uh, for, the, for the website. And I think this is something that uh, will perhaps also um, help us in, uh, in, in getting noticed uh, in terms mm -hmm. of scholarship. And also how the book came about, uh, in addition to Paolo's early support in theory, he said, yes, wonderful. I will write a, a, an intro when you do the book. And this gave me confidence that uh, I can go forward and he will critique whatever we, mm -hmm. we come up with. Uh, also another very important person is Daya Tusu, who is the editor of the, um, uh, of the edition where the, uh, the book was published and uh, who um, is completely an international scholar and has a feeling, a sensibility also to, to this kind of uh, topics. So for us, it was a combination of, of a couple of uh, these uh, things that uh, enabled us uh, to really um, gave me confidence to be able to, to go in this direction and really write the book. And so we had the contract for the book uh, before uh, its final shape was clear. I mean, 
And this is why there's no history in the title, Miklos. This is the answer. And so we, we, there were the three of us and my original ideas, how we will work together to produce this book. And, and by the time the book finally came out, uh, it had changed several times from the original thing. And um, it changed with the inclusion of the fuzzy set. Uh, although this was my original idea to include the fuzzy set analysis, when I started reading more about it, I realized that this was not only a method to analyze the data, but it was a completely different research approach. Yeah. And this research, completely different, which fits very well with a, a historical uh, mm. institutionalism approach. And then with the whole sociological, and I have to tell you that all three of the authors are sociologists. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the only, um, Dina is a political scientist by her PhD degree, but also um, uh, basic study is sociology and in Croatia sociology is a very good uh, program and has always been during socialism when I studied as well, very empirical, western oriented and so on. And um, um, so and Antonia and myself have also PhDs in sociology. I have a master's in communication. So we are primarily social scientists uh, who have uh, um, somehow come to uh, do uh, communication and media research because this is what is uh, the most interesting social process for us. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, certainly, uh, communication is the most interesting social process. And very early on in my studies of sociology, I found um, linguistics and, and um, uh, communication to be something which interests me. So um, it's really, um, mm, this is really why uh, we were able to have this kind of uh, different viewpoint than is um, usually the case with mainstream communication science, especially in the West, where people get um, educated um, um, by the third generation communication scholars mm -hmm who no longer have uh, a direct knowledge of mm -hmm. uh, sociological and political science classics mm -hmm. and uh, who have a completely different, um, um, in many respects, uh, easier input and easier um, um, reception of, uh, of new, new research topics, but then again are lacking in these um, foundational mm -hmm. ideas which enabled us to have this, um, uh, have this um, approach. And then mm, I will not be able to answer all your questions. Uh, you reminded me I have a, had a flashback to my PhD defense uh, when my, one of my <laughs> <laughs> a really famous uh, political scientist and lawyer, Ivan Pajan, who was who was on, on the committee. He he read. Uh, he came, took out a full two page small type uh, um, text, and he read like the questions for like fifteen minutes, and then after <laughs> You know, I thought I was going to faint. And, and then very nicely at the end, he said, well, these are my ideas. You don't have to answer anything. <laughs> so, so, so this was very positive uh, because you put so many important questions and I'm not sure I can answer all of them. Um, we actually do start with the uh, printing uh, historically. Yeah. But in, in many of these countries, um, printing was very late to come about. And so we, we take the modernization to start, the modernization period to start not with the bourgeois revolution, but actually with printing. Mm -hmm. So, so but it's not so, so well um, highlighted uh, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in, the, in the book, so um, it's easy to miss. And um, the role of individuals, of course, exists extremely important, but we didn't deal with it uh, in our book. It was, uh, as uh, Paola said, already too much, um, too many things uh, in it. And uh, there was this need to try and include historical and uh, factual uh, data in the three case studies, because um, I always am a little bit uh, anxious when you have to talk about this uh, a field and this uh, a part of Europe because there isn't really much 
um, analytical um, books or, or texts that uh, you can orient people to. So, so this is why, and since we are not historians, it was extremely difficult to write. You know, so it was, I mean, um, I wrote the, the, the long, the first uh, uh, modernization chapter, and this took me like, I think four or five months, mm -hmm. uh, one chapter alone. And I was never sure. And uh, really uh, several of our colleagues, uh, the Faculty of Political Science, uh, Tihomir Tsipek and Dejan Jovic, they were political scientists who really, really gave us a big service by reading these chapters um, before. And then when we discussed uh, Miklos with Mikhail and, and yourself in, in Copenhagen, I got some more um, feedback that these things were uh, going to work out fine. And um, it's extremely difficult to, uh, to answer all these uh, questions. Let me try and answer a, a few from Paolo. Um, a Soviet legacy. Um, this is another thing, I, the reason why maybe I wanted to write this book because uh, there is no Soviet legacy in uh, post-Yugoslavia because we, we broke with the Soviets in 1948. So the socialist system was completely different. And uh, this, is, um, this is something which is not um, uh, quite um, usually uh, clear yet. So this is, why, this is why I wanted to have the socialist chapter. And uh, the legacy of socialism, of course, is something that must be discussed. But, and I was thinking uh, uh, when we were talking yesterday or the day before uh, at the IUC course that uh, Dina posed the question, what would, should we do um, to, to um, include other countries and so on. And I think that we can only really look at the legacy. I think we, we did a, a mistake with the design. If we wanted to look at, uh, we, we went with a more similar uh, case design to, to look at uh, the impact of socialism uh, um, on post-socialism uh, from the Yugoslav countries. But we really should look at the uh, countries which didn't have socialism, but had other similar characteristics. And then perhaps we can see uh, if the past, um, if there was some kind of uh, legacy which is different. What we found, I think, in our study, and uh, Dina will and Antonia compliment me here, I think we found that the longer durée, as Mikhail suggested, uh, for Russia, the longer durée, so the period preceding socialism, was somehow more important. That uh, actually the socialist period also reflected the, the, the durée from, from before, and then the mm, different types of socialism, which were evident in the, in the different republics um, of uh, Yugoslavia, um, were related to this kind of uh, uh, different, um, different histories and different context experiences uh, from um, 15th century on. So um, I think the institutional um, relationships and uh, um, all of these um, um, transformations and interactions were somehow more related to the pre-socialist than, than what we can see as truly socialist uh, uh, developments because, because socialism was uh, different uh, in these countries. But this is perhaps something that we should try to unpick uh, more and um, perhaps also look um, from this point of view to Katrin's question, does uh, how do the media and the, the communication impact the political systems? Because here also we can, uh, during socialism, uh, perhaps see also a link not only during uh, present day hybrid, uh, uh, systems uh, where we can say that in those republics uh, during Yugoslavia, uh, which had op more open um, mm -hmm. media, more open public spheres, that the um, uh, the political level was also uh, more diverse and pluralist. And it's I don't know how to uh, really uh, um, look at. Um, 
which is influencing which, or mm -hmm. whether they co coexist uh, in in um, in some kind of uh, relationship that is unique always to the context and the historical uh, period. And in 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 relation to the hybrid media system, I mean, this was something um, Paolo that that Paolo wrote in his. Uh, uh, introduction forward to the book that uh, there was too much talk about uh, hybridity in different ways and and your question is very similar I mean it links a little bit uh, to this how can we really uh, look at the hybrid different types of hybridity uh, political hybridity and media hybridity I tried to discuss this a little bit in a in a later text I published in Javnost uh, a few months ago where I tried to unpick, but not so, I didn't go as far as, as you suggest. And that would really be interesting to see how the political systems are changed with, uh, um, with the hybrid uh, uh, media environment. And um, periodization, it does. It's, it was one of the most difficult uh, things, I think, uh, uh, media and, and social change. I think for me, this was one of the most interesting uh, questions and I'm not sure that we answered it uh, fully. I mean, I, I see that there is a lot of work here still to be done. And especially um, to look at not only the, the very far historical periodizations, but also the past 30 years. And this is something that um, we are uh, perhaps uh, um, uh, looking at uh, together with EP and colleagues uh, in a project now, how, how can we look at the last uh, 20 or 30 years uh, uh, in Europe and, and how can we uh, see the changes? What kind of junctures do we see? Uh, can, we, can we discuss it in this way as well? So it's, um, thank you so much uh, for, for looking at our book uh, in this way. And uh, I'm not sure if Paolo, if in the next few months the book will be, the new book will come, but I'm sure so many, so many ideas are still uh, to be developed. That's true. That's absolutely true. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rinka. This uh, is a very rich uh, discussion indeed. And I would like to ask Dina Voja, one of the co-authors, to make her remarks. Mm -hmm. I think many of us would be very interested in the process of work and the division of labor and some of the methodological hardships uh, or challenges you encountered in writing this book. Mm -hmm. so, yes, uh, please. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mikos, and uh, thank you, everyone, for comments and very interesting uh, questions and kind words. Um, yeah, I actually wanted to uh, say uh, that I think this, the writing of the book was also for us uh, an experience of learning and studying. <laughs> um, I think what, uh, one of the, um, the, the, one, the big motivation was also, um, as Professor Mancini said, that this uh, is a, a book with a lot of data, um, a lot of information, it's, the text is very rich. And I think it was, there, there was also motivation to that the authors from Southeastern Europe write a book about South, Southeastern Europe, which will be comprehensive, comprehensive and which will be used with, um, so this rich data can also be used for, for future purposes, for future uh, research. That was one of the motivations as well of, of research. So um, we are also as um, authors, we are also uh, in different gener generations. So we also had different um, uh, different experience and uh, well professional experience and so um, uh, we we had like a division also like in, in um, uh, as, as there is a periodization in the book we also divided our our work um, in based on periodization Zinka uh, said that, uh, she wrote. A chapter about modernization. Um, uh, then Antonia uh, uh, wrote um, a large part uh, of the chapter about uh, socialist period. Um, uh, I, I wrote more, uh, so I, I dedicated more, more analysis also to the, the latest period. But uh, in the end, so okay, there, there was maybe more um, emphasis 
or different authors on different time frames, so the different periods of time. But in the end, um, uh, when we did the analysis, the, the uh, fuzzy set analysis, this 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 is uh, actually a qualitative qualitative analysis uh, where a lot of the the, the conditions the they had to be discussed by all of us. So to define um, uh, the, the, the research strategy. So there were um, many discussions and overlaps. So because um, it, it was also impossible to um, like write a chapter blindly without knowing um, anything about the other, other chapters. So it was constant discussion discussion and we we followed each other um, uh, because we were trying to track the long durée uh, so and the changes uh, in in the media system so the process was really well it was um, <laughs> it, it took a, a, a lot of time and also the uh, the data collection was also because we um, we traveled to uh, to Belgrade to archives. So we did interviews with um, uh, scholars from Southeastern Europe, with journalists from um, uh, Southeastern Europe, and also um, media act and activists from NGOs. And uh, so uh, um, then we um, we had a lot of digging into statistical and different other uh, data from, from different time periods. Um, so there, the, the research process was intensive as well. And we had to, all, all the time we had to go back to the theory and discuss what we found out in our literature review. So um, it was really um, uh, a process from going from the, to the theory to data and then back. Um, um, uh, and I think it also uh, the uh, the work on this book also I think helped helped us to um, break some some of our own preconceptions and uh, stereotypes. Um, and I was also thinking maybe of what uh, Professor Lau uh, said about um, well different post socialist different different socialist experience and different post-socialist experience. So we were discussing a lot of, um, about this. So we found that, yes, the socialist experience was not, it was completely different even uh, inside of the uh, Yugoslavia. Um, uh, and um, I remember that, uh, uh, well, one uh, Croatian historian, Mar Marko Zubak, he's, uh, um, analyzing alternative alternative media in socialism, he said that he sometimes feels feels that you can. Yes, we, we also had uh, this idea that um, okay, uh, Yugoslav socialism was different uh, because it was um, some, something between it was more liberal liberal type of socialism, mar more market based socialism, so it was different. But uh, um, it will be interesting also to develop this, this analysis and to, to see what are actual varieties of, of socialism. So what other subtypes of socialism can we, can we find um, in, uh, in different countries? Um, uh, yes, yeah, so I don't know, there were really a lot of interesting questions. So I don't, I don't know what, um, yeah, maybe I would uh, also, um, Mm, like to uh, comment. Uh, it was also a question from Professor Mancini and uh, Suso. So about so about the Soviet uh, Soviet legacy. Okay. Um, yes, we didn't analyze actual actually Soviet Soviet legacy, but in the beginning of uh, um, um, development of socialist media system in, in Yugoslavia. In the beginning, actually, there was the, the first blue, blueprint, which, which was uh, thought of being uh, taken to, to Yugoslav media system was Soviet. That was the first idea. But then after it completely, it completely changed. So, um, um, so we can see that um, there was a, a, a hybrid, a hybrid system, hybrid, uh, 
um, hybrid structures emerged also in socialism, in these different ideas of how media systems should be, um, uh, should be organized. Um, and um, also, I, um, I heard uh, uh, Mikos also your comment on, on, on civilizations. That was also very interesting for me because so when we were um, uh, so when we were writing the book and also um, discussing the Ottoman legacy and the Austro uh, and the Habsburg uh, uh, legacy, so we found divergence um, uh, depending depending on this legacy, but it, it was also um, uh, for example there, there was. A, also, like a fear that uh, um, not to um, not to look this as some kind of uh, rigid, static um, Huntington Huntington based civil civilization, which just defines everything else. So I think that that is very important to break um, um, the idea that okay, yes, we can find the long durée, but we can see that um, the the institutions change throughout the time. So it's not like um, we can just um, use this civiliz civilizational um, approach to explain then everything. So, um, and um, yes, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I um, there. Okay, there were there were a lot of a lot of interesting questions, but maybe I talk too much now. I'm not sure. <laughs> Never too much. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, and we also have Antonia Chuvalo, the third co-author. So Antonia, please go ahead. The floor is yours. What uh, is it you would like to highlight from the book, mm -hmm. the process mm -hmm. of work? I would really like to say that this is a pathbreaking work without any precedent. So the process and struggles of writing are, are, are important to understand mm -hmm. how truly new perspectives are be excavated and, and sharpened and shown. Okay, uh, hello everybody. Um, uh, thank you, thank you all for your um, generous endorsement and all your comments and questions. Um, yes, this, as Dina said, this uh, writing of this book was a learning process um, and really um, experience, uh, which is not like a learning process uh, in terms of the subject we, we were research, but also like interaction, teamwork, um, writing. Uh, and I think the only person who had the book in a head um, as it finished and it was like um, produced at the end of this process was Rinka, <laughs> who, who had this idea. Uh, and um, she was essence of the book. And uh, I think Dina and me uh, only at the end were aware of what we are writing and what, what, we, um, what we write and on what we are working. Um, it is lots of work, lots of reading, lots of that. Uh, uh, collecting and trying to find how this data fits in the theoretical framework um, and um, also uh, what is um, what is what was in, uh, the, the the most interesting experience for me is um, as, uh, and what is still fascinating for me is the the this part of the book I, I write it uh, the most, the socialist period, and uh, this question of socialist legacy, not Soviet legacy, but socialist legacy is uh, constantly provoking uh, my mind. Um, I think we uh, should research it more definitely, and this is the, 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 the biggest legacy of that period is, I think, rich material for research and um, we still don't know how it, it impacted different fields, political, media field, cultural field, social field. 
Um, I think even though I agree that this long durée past uh, uh, from period before socialism is important for understanding contemporary media system and contemporary societies in this part of the world, I think also socialist period should be addressed um, and researched even, uh, even more, especially this um, specificity for Yugoslavia, self-management self socialism and how it uh, uh, shaped media field, um, media institutions, uh, journalists and journalism, journalism as a profession in this area. And also it, the media system was established in, in that part of history. Um, television system, newspaper system, journalists to learn the practice uh, who, uh, who were like main uh, major actor for transition. So the media when uh, Yugoslavia was broken up and socialist system was um, broken didn't start from nothing. They they continued to exist, Ch changing. They were changed, but also uh, we we can trace this long durée, this past uh, past uh, dependency um, uh, in that basic fact that nothing was ruined but transformed in in a way. So I think this is still um, still a subject of um, my interest, but also I think it is important um, for scientists in uh, different fields uh, of social scientists to to address this period, and it's still under res under researched, and there are lots of taboos, um, preconception, prejudice, prejudice. Um, in regard to uh, to that part of uh, to that part of um, our history, uh, uh, so um, also what is interesting, uh, what was um, uh, uh, what I would like to address is you ask like. There are many, many things uh, we put in the book, many data, many facts, um, uh, but you, you should stop <laughs> in the morning. As Paolo said, you should finish the book. So I think that question of um, periodization, socialist legacy, importance of personalities, as Miklos asked, uh, in this juncture periods, uh, that that is something that that is hard to answer at the moment. And um, either we are three of us, or some of us, uh, some of, uh, or some other <laughs> researchers have to do lots of work <laughs> uh, and um, research it to, to 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 come to some kind of conclusions or answers. To, to these questions. Um, okay. Uh, I, if you have anything else to ask, um, yeah, please. I'll, and I'll thank you. you, thank you very much, and thank you especially Zrinka and Dina. She's a, like Fuzzy said, guru. She did like lots of this really. Um, hard work on 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 uh, statistics and uh, fuzzy set calibration. Um, so I think uh, the book is uh, like it is and good because of their very hard contribution, great contribution and hard work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antonio. <clears throat> I would like to ask, uh, our time is almost over. I would like to ask a final question of the three authors. We talked a lot about how your approach can help to explain present day outcomes. And that was the original intention of the book, to look at several countries in Southeastern Europe today. Why is the media system as it is? That's the, one of the chapter titles. But I would also like to ask maybe 
At the same time, you also contributed to a great deal of media history of South Eastern Europe. Maybe unintentionally, there is a second achievement of this book. It seems to me that you provided a model for media history for the narrowly defined field. This might have not been your intention. But if I look at Hungarian media history, or for that matter, British, French, or, or Danish, or, or Norwegian media history, perhaps this kind of historical institutionalist approach inform media history. There is the Journal of Media History, which was, I believe, initiated by James Curran a generation ago. So I wonder what's uh, your take on, on this, this kind of long durée, anal school inspired um, social history, contextualized media history. I wonder what's your take on that? That's a very interesting um, um, point of view. And I remember when I was, um, I, I mustn't say read, uh, reading Eisenstein's books because it's a book because it's too I mean nobody can read that oh it's unreadable <laughs> yeah I, yeah it's I mean it, and then but there is a little quote uh, or something yeah. the beginning saying that oh my god what am I doing you know am I ever going to be unraveled from this uh, 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 work because it's I mean nobody in their sane mind would do that so um, at a certain point in time in our book, I was feeling the same uh, because the only reason uh, we, we did the case studies of the period is because there was no data. There was, there was nothing, you know, if there had been books on this, it would have been much easier to write uh, our book um, and focus much more on, for instance, one of the things um, um, which I think is also a contribution, which we didn't and don't really mention so much is look at how the different dimensions and, and the variables which explain media systems have transformed during these, all this time. This is in the last chapter. This is one of the things that seems like, you know, just lit, little work, but this was a lot of challenge when Dina was talking about fuzzy set calibration. This is something that was part of this to see how how can we really put all this huge history into uh, variables that will define the outcomes? So, so I would personally never want to write another history again, uh, but I hope, uh, I hope other people will do. And um, because um, um, to write a comparative account of six countries, remember th these are six countries. Right. It's not one country, but six countries. Um, uh, in a historical fashion, it really, really took a lot of work. I mean, it couldn't have been done by one person alone. It would have taken another 10 years. So without Antonia and Dina doing uh, their chapters. And then of course, uh, I couldn't leave it, but had to uh, add my own things and readings and so on, but that's natural. And then the last chapter, I, I remember when Paolo was reading it, he says, look, but this is not a conclusion. This is a completely new thing that is in the last chapter. The last chapter was a huge, a huge work actually. And this is what we really wanted to do. But in order to do the last chapter, you had to go through all the steps before. So it was, this is why it took so long. I mean, it really did take so long. Um, I think seven or eight years. And I think, um, or even more. I think in, in the ECREA conference in Istanbul, when we were presenting Paolo in the same session, and I was thinking how to, how to make my presentation. And you know, wow, I'm in the same session with Paolo Mancini. And uh, this is when the whole concept was uh, for this conference was uh, born the whole idea of historical institutionalism, periodization, and so on. And then it took uh, almost 10 years to develop into a book, mm -hmm. to research, to, to study, uh, published a couple of um, theoretical articles, one empirical before with ideas, but then to develop it into, so it's, um, I would never recommend anybody to write the history. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the Opus Magnum is out, your oeuvre is rich, and 
We're just starting Miklos, but not with. Uh, yeah, yeah, and other opus bundums will will, uh, will come up. At this point, uh, we need to look at the clock and uh, realize that our time is over. So it's exactly 5.30 uh, now. I would like to thank the, and congratulate from the bottom of my heart, uh, the three authors, Zrinka Perushko, Dina Vojab, and Antonia Chualo for their pathbreaking work for that seven, eight years of writing and plus several years. So it's a decade of your life. <laughs> and now, we have a saying in Hungarian that you put a book on the table and the table will crush. <laughs> it's, it's a book uh, like that. So truly, um, I would uh, wish the best uh, for uh, this uh, book. It will be an impactful, influential book. I hope it will fly high. And I express the best wishes on, the, uh, on behalf of our whole panel and those who know your work, our greatest appreciation. And finally, I would like to say that we also appreciate the Anna School and Fernand Brodel for their inspiration, because one can see your work as an offshoot of the Anna School's work. So it's kind of a late uh, generational impact of, of the Anna School for Southeast uh, European Media Scholarship, which will probably uh, also impact uh, other countries at this point. Thank you very much for all of you and uh, also for our viewers and um, I wish you good reading of the Thank book. you Miklos so much for organizing this and everybody for, for uh, speaking and especially to Dina and Antonia uh, for the hard work and uh, I'm not an easy taskmaster sometimes but their contribution was very very uh, important and the book wouldn't be able without them. Okay. Someone Thank is asking in, in the chat how many pages. It's 301 pages. So it doesn't it take over, that. It was over the contract. It was over the 10% of the contract. I had to say, okay, can we, can we keep uh, all this? Okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. And all oh, the... Ciao. Yeah. Ciao. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank, 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 Thank you. Hope to see you in person soon somewhere. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, so. Ciao. 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 Take care. Dovidenia. Ďakujeme. Dovidenia. <laughs> Chvála. 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 Hm. It was really nice.